Hollywood, brilliant tinsel city of lights and fantasy. Hollywood, glorified, glittering, fascinating, fabulous, mythical kingdom. Hollywood reaches far, carrying its cargo of dreams to almost every city and village in the world. To these people, to you, and to me, the movies bring magic. Yet, if seen the right way, they can also be a lens through which we view the world, and maybe even a pathway to find God. One of the things that I forgot to mention uh, as I extended a welcome this morning was that uh, if you'll notice that we are not playing our organ today, uh, that is not by accident. We are actually doing some construction work back in the organ, organ chambers, uh, and so it is uh, out of order for just a while. It's doing fine. Uh, no need to worry, but uh, today we are enjoying the piano prowess of Amy Stewart and Janet Pummel. And so it is good for us to be together. I want to say a special welcome to those that are joining us online as well as those that are listening on the radio this morning on KTCU. We are glad that you have chosen to be with us. We are continuing our blockbuster summer sermon series that we are calling Real Faith, looking at several different movies and seeing where God shows up. And this week, as I mentioned, we are looking at the movie Coda, which recently won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Interestingly enough, at least to me, this was the first Best Picture winner that was never released in theaters. This is one that was, uh, went straight to uh, a streaming service, an Apple TV. And so uh, I find that interesting. Perhaps you do as well, that your uh, phone company now is the one that is uh, producing movies. Uh, CODA, which is a, an acronym for Child of Deaf Adults, is the simple but yet heartwarming coming-of-age story set in a fishing town outside of Boston. And Ruby, the 17-year-old girl, is a, the only hearing member of her family, but yet she loves to sing. Friends, I absolutely love this movie. And I can't wait to talk about it. But first, I invite you to turn with me in your pew pocket Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. Uh, just as Coda is a coming of age story, uh, what you're about to hear is an origin story, sometimes referred to as an etiology. Uh, those stories try to explain how and why something came to be, the origins of something. For instance, the creation stories are etiologies, a way of explaining how God created the heavens and the earth. In this case, the story of Babel is meant to explain why the world's people all speak different languages. If we came from one place, why is it that we are scattered all over the world and speak in different languages? So I invite you to listen now to this word from Genesis chapter 11. The scripture is from Genesis chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for, for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, 
so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So about 20, 25 years ago, back when I was in my early 30s, I was going through a fairly difficult time in my life. My marriage at the time was a mess. I was depressed. I was angry a lot, and most of that anger was directed at God, which, as you can imagine, as a minister, that's not a good place to be. And so I made an appointment to go see a spiritual director. Now, a spiritual director is a lot like a counselor, but one who walks with you as you try to sort out and figure out matters of faith. Shannon Moore, who's on our staff, is a certified spiritual director, sort of helps people, walks with them. So I went and met this spiritual director, and I poured out as honestly as I could sort of where I was emotionally, where I was spiritually, what I was dealing with, what I was going through, and he listened quite empathetically. He didn't give me any advice but he encouraged me to pray. And he taught me some important prayer tactics, techniques that involve mostly listening rather than speaking. We sometimes forget that that's the most important part of prayer, don't we? We're quick to tell God what we want without listening to what God wants. In this case, I listened as best as I could And then, after our hour was up, he sent me on our way. And as I was getting ready to walk out the door, I put my hand on the doorknob, and I started to open the door, and he said, my prayer for you, Russ, is that you will find your own voice. I smiled, I nodded, and I made my way to my car. And when I got in the car, before I started the engine, I sort of smacked the steering wheel fairly hard. And I said out loud to no one in particular, find your own voice. You've got to be kidding me. I'm dying here. And that's the best advice you have for me? Give me something I can use, I thought. But then over the next few days and weeks and years and now decades, I have discovered that that search to find my own voice has been the most important quest that I have ever taken in my entire life. And even now, years later, there are times when I fear that I've I've lost that voice, that I've sort of wandered away from that call that God has placed and planted within me. And worst of all, I've let the thoughts and the opinions of others drown out my own voice. Mia Hollow is a poet, and she once wrote this, every now and again you will feel a dull ache in your soul, a gentle humming around your heart, a longing for something without a name. And if I ever told you to obey anything, this would be it. Listen to the call of your authentic self, that part of you that lives just outside of your skin. Let it have its way with you. For I have died a hundred times trying to ignore it. In this movie, Coda, Ruby is a 17-year-old high school student, and her life revolves around acting as an interpreter for her parents and her brother as well as working on her family's struggling fishing boat every morning before school. She was up at 3 o'clock to fish before making it to school at 8.30. 
But then when she gets to school, she joins her high school's choir, and she discovers in the midst of that this love for singing, but also that she has a gift for singing. And so she's encouraged by her enthusiastic, tough love choir master to, to, to apply to a prestige, prestigious music school. And yet, in the midst of that, she feels torn between the obligations that she feels for her family and the pursuit of her own dreams and that call that God has placed in her life. I suspect that a lot of us can understand at some level that we have all struggled in some way, shape, or form to find identities apart from our family, from our parents. We've felt burdened by their expectations. Ultimately, Ruby, just like all of us, Ruby has to find her own voice. And for her, though, it is both literal as well as metaphorical. In one of the early scenes, Ruby comes to see her choir teacher. In the previous scene, she had gotten embarrassed in the very first class, and she ran out of class when she was asked to sing. And now she comes back to apologize, to speak to her teacher, a little bit scared, a little bit embarrassed. And the teacher, upon seeing her, said, you know, most people who are terrified of singing don't sign up for choir, which I think is a fairly honest, pretty smart thing to do, right? But she explains that she was anxious, that she's oftentimes picked on and made fun of, and that she was younger, she talked funny. And he recognizes and realizes and remembers that she is the only one in her family that can speak, can hear, and yet she loves to sing. Interesting, he says. Are you any good? And she shrugs and she says, I, I don't know. But she goes on to explain that the reason that she ran out of class was that she was afraid, not just of the other kids, but of finding out that she wasn't any good. He thought for a moment, and he said, do you know what David Bowie once said about Bob Dylan? He said that his voice was like sand and glue. And then he said, there are plenty of pretty voices out there that have nothing to say. Do you have something to say? She says, I think so. He said, good. Then I'll see you in class. Friends, here's what I believe to be true with all that I am, that like Ruby, we all have something to say. We all have a unique voice. We all have something valuable to contribute to this world that God has placed within us this sense of call, this voice that God has given us this life, this one life, and invites us and calls us to live it authentically, that you have value, that you have worth, that you are a part of what God is doing in this world, that you have something to say and something the world desperately needs to hear. Each of us, all of us are unique. Each of us have been given a distinctive voice. And when you find that voice, your story will be told. In that moment, you will be heard. Because finding your voice is speaking and living your truth. Steve Jobs once said, your time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. So my prayer for you is that you will find your own voice. You know, some of the criticism of the movie, I read all sorts of reviews and all sorts of things that were written about it. Some of the criticism was that it was sort of cliche, that it was predictable, that it was easy to see what was going to happen. And I suppose that's true. It's a coming of age story. Aren't they all pretty much the same? This person comes of age. I think that's sort of a sacred formula there. I suppose that's not fair, but the truth is I loved it anyway. As one critic said, you knew what was going to happen, but the ride to get there was so sweet. 
I knew what was coming, but I still loved it, and I would echo that sentiment exactly. It's not a new formula. In fact, it's even itself a remake of a French film, both about a family in which three of the four are deaf. This one is set in New England, centered around a fishing boat. That other one in France, centered around a dairy farm. But I think what makes this movie so unique, what makes it so special is the cast. Because the actors that play the characters that are deaf are actually deaf. There is an authenticity about this that comes through. In fact, Marley Matlin, who is an incredible actress herself, she plays the mom. She's won an Academy Award for another role that she played years ago. And when she was asked to play this role, she said on one condition, and that is that the other actors that play the characters of deaf people are deaf themselves. And so they agreed, and so she signed on. And the father, a gentleman by the name of Troy Kotzer, won an Academy Award for this role as best supporting actor in this film, one of three that Coda ended up winning. And Kotzer and Matlin are the only two deaf actors to ever win an Oscar. Now, let me just say this parenthetically for just a moment. If you haven't watched his acceptance speech or the acceptance speech of any of the three uh, Academy Awards that, you, uh, that they won this last year, won by the, by the uh, producers, but also most importantly by the, by the director, Sean uh, Hader. I encourage you, I, I implore you to go find that online uh, because it is so much more powerful and so much more important than Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. So you need to go see that. So where this film really thrives is in its intimate, its thoughtful examination of the life for Ruby and her deaf family, in their struggle to, to get by in a world that was made for those that can hear. One of the most moving scenes in the film is when Ruby is having one of her choir concerts, and her family sits there, all three of them, completely out of place. You can imagine what it must be like to go to go to a concert when you can't hear, to not know what is being said, not being able to hear the music. And at one point, one point in the midst of that, from behind, you can see the family and you can see what's happening on stage and then the music fades out and the movie goes silent. And you are able to briefly experience that as they experience it with no sound. They can only see the happy faces around them, the clapping of the audience, which lets them know that, that Ruby's singing was effective, although in a way that they can never experience, let alone understand. It's incredibly powerful, this being able to put yourself in their place. In fact, that empathy, one person wrote, that empathy is the beating heart of this movie, and I would completely agree. Now, Having said all that, I would be completely remiss if I didn't point out that the deaf community is a very rich, proud community. That they don't consider themselves as being anything less. They don't consider themselves to be disabled, simply specially abled. That they work together to make change and to open doors, but yet, but yet sometimes those in the deaf community struggle to find their place in the hearing community and we saw that in the movie, that they oftentimes felt like they just didn't fit in. Often because, often because the hearing community makes no effort whatsoever to include them, to bring them in. And at one point, Ruby's brother asked why it's always on him to fit in with the hearing people, as he called them, and why are they not willing to try and fit in with me? I'm willing to guess, I'm willing to bet that we all know at some level what it's like to not fit in, to not feel like you belong, to feel left out in some way, shape, or form. For instance, Ruby's parents, they can't fully understand, they can't appreciate her love and her passion for music. In fact, if anything, at the beginning of the film, it's a source of conflict 
And her mother, who's deaf, says to her, wait, you want to sing? Is that because I'm deaf? If I were blind, would you want to paint, she says. And also Ruby herself, who doesn't fit in. She doesn't fit in with her family, but she isn't at home at school either. In fact, it's fitting that her song of choice is Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now, which is an expression of the tension that she lives in every day. Amelia Jones, who plays Ruby, she said, as a coda, you are a part of two worlds, and sometimes you can feel that you don't belong in either, and so that made Ruby a very layered character. This last week, I had the opportunity to speak to a woman by the name of Jennifer. Ann Dar is a member of our congregation. She's a deaf education teacher, and she connected me with Je Jennifer. Jennifer is a coda person here in Fort Worth that grew up with deaf parents. And so I had an opportunity to hear from her, to, for her to share her experience with me, her experience of growing up as a CODA, but also of watching this film. And she said that it was really cool, it was really cool to be able to see her life in a movie, not something that many of us get to experience but she also said that it helped her give voice to some of the struggle of being in two worlds at one time, not fully fitting in in either, having to be a bridge between these two worlds. There was a ton of pressure on me, she said. But it wasn't a burden. It was just pressure. I never felt fully at home, either in home my deaf community, but also at school in the hearing community. She said, interestingly enough, though, interestingly enough, I felt more at home in the deaf community than I did in the hearing community, in part because the deaf community was more inclusive. Like the story from Scripture that we heard a moment ago, we can see the power of language to be able to communicate or not. The power that language has to, to tear people apart and to leave them ostracized, but also to bring them together. That language has this ability to help us understand one another and the world around us. That we use language to express ourselves, to express our values, our belief system, our faith. And in a world that seems increasingly polarized, both socially and spiritually, but also politically, we need to find ways to communicate clearly, to express empathy, to allow others to be seen and heard. How might the world be different if every conversation that we have, that someone has a different opinion, that we focus left on making sure that our point is communicated but rather than we fully understood what they are trying to say. Interestingly, these folks behind me will tell you that CODA is not just an acronym for a child of deaf adults, but also a musical term, a term for a passage that brings a piece to an end. So there is this connection, this tie between music language, art, bringing it all together. Director Sean Hader said that, that when she views ASL, American Sign Language, that it's almost like music. It's perhaps even more like dance because it can be a language of grace and emotion that conveys things in a way that a mere spoken word can't. There's one part in the film when, when the music teacher, Mr. V, has asked Ruby, how do you feel when you sing? She thinks for a moment and then responds but by signing, not by speaking. And those of us who don't know American Sign Language don't know fully what she's saying, but know at a very deep and profound level that what she's saying is that she experiences things on a higher level. In one of the most powerful moments of the movie, Ruby is auditioning for the Berkeley School of Music. 
And her parents come with her. They want to be there to support. But she, they are not allowed into the auditorium. Just those that are judging. But as Ruby's parents would do in a situation like that, they sneak in the back and they go sit up in the balcony. And as she begins to sing, she also begins to sign. And that not only brings her parents into the experience, but her signing enhances the emotion of the song. There is this emotionality, this beauty, this depth that can only be expressed in a very profound way, in ways that words alone can't. You see, ultimately, Coda is a film that celebrates the power of family. Even when parents and children struggle to understand each other. It asks us to consider how well are we listening to one another? Do we hear each other? Do we see each other? Do we understand what other people are experiencing, what they're suffering through? Do we really listen to the cries of other people's hearts? It invites us to ask ourselves how we are listening and responding to that call that places, that God places in all of our hearts. It challenges us to see with our eyes and to hear with our ears so that we can love with our hearts. It's a beautiful story about what it means to be yourself, to be family, to be the embodiment of love. There are many pretty voices out there that have nothing to say. Do you have something to say? I think you do. In my prayer for you, my prayer for you is that you will find your own voice.